Between the end of Black Ops 1 and the first half of Black Ops 2, Zombies was in a bit of a liminal state, kind of stuck between two worlds. The developers at Treyarch knew they wanted to evolve the mode beyond its very basic wave survival roots, so they had been trying to shake up the formula, but so far nothing had really stuck the landing. After a pretty much universally beloved run of maps, with all the World at War entries and then including Kino de Toten and Ascension, some players were starting to think that, especially with the one-two punch of Transit and then Die Rise, Zombies was losing its touch and Black Ops 2 would never recapture that same classic magic. Those maps absolutely did have a lot of interesting design ideas and redeeming qualities, but some of those ideas felt half-baked or with unintended consequences. It felt like they were still throwing things at the wall to see what stuck, instead of committing hard to one specific direction. That changed with Mob of the Dead. A map that really felt like the start of a new era, and the one where they really put their foot down and committed hard to a singular vision for the future of the mode. It really revitalized the hype that had been dying for Black Ops 2 Zombies, and while some classic players were turned off by the new direction, new ones started to fall in love with the mode. It's undeniable that Treyarch found the blueprint for the next two full games here in Alcatraz. <laughs> What Mob did that was such a revolution was actually really simple. It just put the story first. Where past maps were intentionally obscure, with most of the plot being in hidden radios and the endings of easter eggs were usually completely incomprehensible without context, this map tried to tell a complete narrative that was at least relatively understandable for mainstream audiences. It took place in Alcatraz Penitentiary, a setting you didn't have to suspend disbelief for it to feel realistic because it was a real place that they actually recreated really accurately. The cell block and the docks especially were almost one-to-one -one replicas. And overall, it was the kind of location where mainstream audiences were primed to expect stories to be set. Then, there was a celebrity cast of famous gangster movie actors playing not tongue-in-cheek cameos like in Call of the Dead, but genuine roles like they would in a movie or other story to be taken seriously. All the characters played off of classic gangster movie tropes so you could get to know them and get immersed in the narrative in a really limited amount of time, and they were all charismatic and interesting enough for you to feel attached to them as protagonists while still recognizing that you're being explicitly shown that they're bad people who deserve the purgatory that they're in. It was some really clever and efficient writing to allow them to establish this new standalone story without making you wait too long to get into the gameplay. In fact, that relationship between story and gameplay is what I think sets this map apart from anything that came out both before or after it. All the Black Ops 3 and 4 maps leaned heavily into this more quest-based design as opposed to the sandbox style of earlier maps, but what I don't think they ever captured again was that perfect synergy between the narrative and the game mechanics. Take something like Bioshock. That story was very specific to games, and you couldn't tell it in something like a movie, because the metaphor is explicitly a commentary on player agency. The gameplay and the story being told are deeply intertwined. It's not just any old script that you just happen to be holding a controller during. The act itself of playing the game elevates the message. In Mob of the Dead, you have something similar. It's a narrative about the characters being stuck in a cycle, living their lives, dying, and then restarting back from the beginning. It's an examination of the experience of playing zombies. You play as long as you can, but there's no way to win. At some point, it's inevitable that you're going to die and have to restart back from round one. The characters are stuck in a cycle only because, really, the players are as well, and that parallel is the real magic of Mob of the Dead. In canon, the characters are stuck in a purgatory dimension, ostensibly to be punished for everything they did as criminals. Later, in Blood of the Dead, it was revealed that the Shadow Man convinced the Warden to sacrifice their souls to use their energy to create a pocket dimension to trap Primus Richtofen to use his blood to open a gateway to Agartha to release the Apothecons. But, more interesting to me is how it was told in isolation here where there's no real explanation, and it's more similar to, for example, one of my favorite games, Silent Hill 2. In both cases, the characters are stuck in some kind of twisted mirror dimension and punished over and over again for their sins. Similar to Silent Hill, the map actually takes place in a horrific inversion of the real Alcatraz, with bodies hanging on meat hooks and barbed wire digging into the environment and the zombies themselves. 
the distorted, glitchy perks, and the box, HUD, and zombie eyes all being different from any other map really hammer home that this isn't taking place in the real world that all other maps up until now have taken place in. The purgatory that the mobsters were stuck in meant that they were constantly being chased and killed by zombies, and even if they managed to execute the escape plan, they were destined to either die by electric chair or fall into infighting and continue the cycle that way. As the map says, no one escapes alive. Unlike all of the other crews who were survivors banding together to valiantly fight the Horde and secure a better tomorrow, this was a fragile alliance of selfish criminals. Even though it is admittedly pretty cool when you get to the end of the easter egg for the first time and you have to fight the first true PvP in Zombies, the music clues you into the fact that this is supposed to be a sad moment. The story is really a tragedy in how it always falls apart. Even in the quote unquote good ending when the players break the cycle, the mobsters aren't free, they're just allowed to die. That cycle break was actually the first win condition in Zombies, with the game ending when you completed the easter egg. Again, leading back into that focus on story, stories have conclusions. The lead up to get to that point was incredibly simple, with the whole quest basically just being two steps on top of the basic setup. One reason for that was that because the narrative was so important here, they wanted to make sure that the end of that story was relatively accessible to most players. Also, you the player being forced to go through the cycle over and over again really reinforces the theme and makes you connect with what the characters are going through. Overall, I think this map as a whole is really a masterclass on the art of writing specifically for video games. Core to this theme of dying and restarting is the new afterlife system. The final entry on that tombstone and who's who evolution chain, this is where I think they finally nailed that subversion of the old simple down and death system. Quick Revive didn't even exist here, it was fully replaced by this new system where if you went down, you entered afterlife mode, where zombies wouldn't chase you, and like who's who, you could pick yourself back up. But it was more than just a simple saving grace for if you failed. It was its own gameplay mode with its own advantages, and it could be used tactically and intentionally. To that end, there were little boxes around the map where you could willingly enter afterlife and keep your perks if you did so. The reason that it was so important was that there was no power switch on the map. Instead, each individual utility, like a perk machine, had its own panel that you could shock in afterlife mode to turn on. With maps getting bigger and bigger, it was making less and less sense for power to be a single binary switch. Afterlife made the process of unlocking the map a lot smoother instead of just that single game-changing flip. It was also really engaging in how it rewarded mastery of both new and old skills. Because you only got a limited number every round, it was a resource to be managed by learning the layout and getting good at platforming to optimize how much you could get done in a single use. And, because getting downed by the zombies would use up that afterlife charge in a position that might not be optimal, you wanted to get good at the core survival game loop of the mode as well, so you weren't being slowed down that way. I honestly think the afterlife system is one of the best new features they've ever added to the series with how it makes the map unlock process so much more engaging, while also encouraging players to practice new skills outside of the usual zombies toolkit and doing it all while being thematically appropriate and supporting the story. There are two cliche words that everyone uses when talking about Mob of the Dead. The first one is atmosphere. That comes from the really unique Hell Dimension setting that immersed you in a world that was very distinct from any map we'd ever seen before. Even more than just being visually interesting and leaning further into horror than we'd ever seen, the map was really a character of its own with some really great environmental storytelling, like the Warden's office being in an obviously worse state of decay than anywhere else with paper over the windows and occult symbols all over the walls. The second word you'll hear over and over again is flow. I think what people are trying to get at there is that, in a complete 180 from the past couple maps, in Mob you're basically progressing 100% of the time. My biggest problem with both Transit and Die Rise is that a lot of the time you're just waiting around. There's a lot of time spent where you're not progressing and you're not doing what you want to be doing. This map completely turned that on its head and now you never feel like you're between gameplay events. Every moment is part of the action. The goal of the setup was to find all the different parts for the plane so you could fly it to the bridge where the pack-a-punch was. It was the start of the era of maps that were so complicated that they made multiple YouTubers' careers because guides were necessary for casual players to do even the basics. 
I do think that here it was done well and wasn't too bad in that sense. For one, there were maps all over the walls telling you where to look, but more than that, it was designed really well with all the spokes of the map having a pack-a-punch piece at the end of them. It made it so that there was no way to go in the wrong direction. No matter which way you went, you would eventually come across something useful. In that way, it's a lot like a five-pointed Doris, where the key to unlocking Pack-a-Punch was just following each path of the map to its natural conclusion. It does require some legwork, but it's still a lot more approachable than something like Shadows of Evil, which layers a lot more on top of that basic exploration. There, it's not as simple as just finding the points of interest, you also have to find a couple easy-to-miss crates you can only see in beast mode to get the ritual items. Shadows is fantastic in its own way, but it did put off a lot of players, even the kind of people who liked Mob, because it just didn't have that same level of intuitive flow. But it's not just that intuition guiding you to the end goals that makes Mob feel so consistently good. To fill the time along the way to the plane parts, you were also doing a bunch of other things as well to give you that feeling of constant progression. You'd be using Afterlife to power up perks and open doors, so that was always permanent progress. And you'd also be feeding the dogs' heads by killing zombies near them to eventually earn the Hell's Retriever, a powerful tactical weapon that could kill a handful of zombies and then fetch any power-ups and bring them to you on the way back. By the time you killed enough zombies to finish the dog that you were working on, you'd have enough points to open the next door, and so on. You'd be able to stay in that rhythm. The idea of a story-based map can be kind of concerning at first, because there's the worry of needing it to be linear to tell the story in the way they want. But they did a really good job of making sure that instead of having to hold your hand to guide you down the one right path, they gave you a lot of freedom and you could go basically any direction, and it would always be the right way for something. There were a lot of smaller things they added too to make sure that the tediousness of past maps didn't happen again. That was something they were making a very clear attempt to fix here. For example, the buildable system was finally changed so that instead of only being able to carry one item, you could instead pick up all the pieces at your leisure and then build the item in one trip. Just from the perspective of moment-to-moment -moment enjoyment, this might be the most valuable addition to come out of this map. The old single carry system was an interesting idea executed in one of the worst possible ways. It didn't make the game mechanic any more challenging or interesting, it just artificially lengthened the amount of time it took to build things by making you do three back and forth trips. Now you could collect the pieces for the acid gat kit and the shield as you continued your progress through the map, instead of having to stop progressing every single time you found one to bring it back to a bench. The plane parts worked the same way, at least in solo. In co-op, you could still only carry one, but they still did what they could to reduce tedium by making you not have to do the little puzzles more than once. After you unlocked them for the first time, whenever you needed to refuel the plane, the parts would just be sitting in the open around the map. While it definitely was more complex than previous maps, it really worked hard to guide the player through at least the basic setup. It's pretty intuitive to get to a point where you have Pack-a-Punch open, the Hell's Retriever, and the Wonder Weapon out of the box, so it never feels like it's intentionally obtuse or too impenetrable to learn. That way, the developers could add the real complicated stuff in the side easter eggs without putting new players off right from the start. For example, once you got the Hell's Retriever, you could do a little side quest to upgrade it to the Hell's Redeemer, which did infinite damage. Or, by doing a set of steps that were honestly more abstract than the main easter egg for the map, you could get the spoon and then upgrade it to the golden spork, a melee weapon that could one-hit kill until round 35. It made it so that you had some time to get good at the regular gameplay of the map, and then you could hear about or look up these secrets and feel like there was a whole new layer of the game opening up to you. It was smart of them to add that depth progressively. In terms of more conventional new map additions, we got a new perk with Electric Cherry. It made it so that every time you reloaded, a shockwave would stun and sometimes kill enemies around you, which was really appreciated in the tight hallways here, so you could tactically keep your gun empty until you got cornered. The fewer bullets you had, the more powerful the blast, so you were incentivized to not always have all your firepower available to you. That made it synergize really well with the wonder weapon for the map, the Blundergat, which was a shotgun with a wide horizontal spread so you could kill zombies in front of you in a big radius. Importantly, unless it was pack-a-punched into the sweeper, it only ever had one shot or burst in the clip, so every single time you shot it, you'd be getting the most potential out of your electric cherry reload burst. 
Then, one of the buildables for the map was the Acid Gat Kit, which let you upgrade a Blundergat into a version that fired sticky explosives that locked zombies into place, and when you upgraded it, those explosives behaved like monkey bombs. The map didn't feel exclusively built around any one specific new addition, there was obviously a lot of different things going on, but the way that subgroups of features work together helped the map feel like a cohesive whole. There was a new boss, Brutus, whose name we only got from a single achievement description. He was a lot like the Avogadro or George Romero in that he appeared alongside the zombies instead of in his own round. While he definitely would chase and try to down players, he would also lock down any perk machine, mystery box, or buildable table that he passed along the way, and you'd have to pay to make it usable again. It was well balanced in a way that, when you heard him coming, he was enough of a threat that you felt a good amount of tension, but it also wasn't overdone to the point where he was an instant game ender and you felt like you were running up against an impenetrable brick wall. A lot of people who don't have as much experience with game development put, I think, a bit too much stock in single figureheads like map directors, and ignore how collaborative the process of making games really is, especially at a team the size of Treyarch. At the same time, though, it's hard not to notice a shift in the direction of the series when the zombies' lead changed from Jimmy Zielinski, who did all the maps up until Die Rise and Buried, to Jason Blundell, who led this map, Origins, and then all of Black Ops 3 and 4. Just looking at the clear comparison within Black Ops 2, there's a very clear distinction between the fan reaction for Transit and Die Rise, and Mob and Origins. I don't think that's got as much to do with the director as some people think, and I think it's actually pretty unfair to put that all on one person in Jimmy Zielinski when he was a very ambitious creator who led all the Black Ops 1 maps, and Buried, which came after this and was a fan favorite. What I do think is that the team as a whole really took some time to figure out what they wanted the new era of zombies to be, and they stumbled a couple times on their way of taking that generational leap forward. Whatever it was, with Mob of the Dead, they finally found a formula that they were proud of, and gave zombies a new life that would carry it forward into what some hardcore fans would say is the golden age of Black Ops 3. 